Well, hello there. I'm Drew Badger, the co-founder of EnglishAnyone.com, and today I'm just going to answer a whole bunch of questions I received uh, from some students at a school from Brazil. A few months ago, I was contacted by Diego Ruan, and I hope I pronounced his name properly. Uh, he has a lot of energy, and I was really excited to receive his mail. Uh, but he invited me to speak with some of the learners at Parque Idiomas. It's the uh, name of a school in Brazil. Uh, so they invited me to talk about education and learning and lots of other things like that. But we only had a little bit of time to discuss things. So now, even though it's been a few months since we had that actual conversation, I wanted to talk, uh, kind of go into the other things that we didn't get to. So right now, I'm going to answer a whole bunch of these questions and so they and everyone else can uh, learn the answers, learn a little bit more about how I think about education and a few other things. Uh, and hopefully uh, they enjoy. Enjoy. Basically what I do with English Anyone is help students cross the fluency gap. Uh, and this is basically you have, um, because of how a lot of students learned, they began, uh, you know, learning in regular kind of the traditional way where you, there are basically kind of four main problems with it. Uh, the first one is that you're learning to uh, think about English in your own language and then translate things. And then the kind of second thing is you are kind of making a lot of So basically what I do with EnglishAnyone.com, I basically have one I basically have one main focus with EnglishAnyone.com and that's helping students cross the fluency gap. A lot of students, there's basically kind of two different ways of learning a language. There's the natural way that most people use when they're learning their first language and then the kind of unnatural way uh, or the way that only gives you part of the fluency puzzle. So a lot of students, uh, maybe you watching this right now, when you began learning, you started learning in your own language. So that taught you to think and translate when you speak. Uh, you weren't able to remember the words. You might know the names of lots of grammar rules, but you don't actually know how to use them confidently when you speak. Most of the listening practice exercises you had in school and even now, they are the nice kind of slow, easy, even the way I'm speaking right now, that kind of slow, easy English, so you're good at listening to slow, easy English, but listening to native speakers with fast speech and idioms and phrases and quotes from movies, things like that, that's really difficult to understand. Uh, and because you had a little problem, uh, kind of little exposure to that kind of English, it turned you into a person that could only understand that kind of easy uh, English and you weren't able to learn pronunciation because uh, that kind of listening training with real English, uh, you know, the actual kind of native conversational English that native speakers use, you didn't have much exposure to that. So basically what that did is kind of put uh, a lot of students and maybe yourself watching out there uh, into a bubble. So you've got kind of the, the kind of like safe learning things for tests and grammar rules, that kind of thing, but you never learned how to cross uh, over here to native fluent English. So this space here, this is what I call the fluency gap. Uh, and basically what I do is help students cross the fluency gap uh, with videos and, you know, a master English conversation as well. This is a very nice, uh, simple and easy way to transition from the language that you know over here, but in nice, easy steps. So that's basically what I do with EnglishAnyone.com. Initially, EnglishAnyone.com was just kind of a, an experimental thing, um, you know, working on producing different kinds of videos, but uh, a lot of it, the, uh, the kind of problem I had really was more how can I take the lessons that I produce for my own students in the classroom and bring them out to a much wider audience. So that was really the focus for me, uh, the main thing I wanted to do when I was first starting the program. I would definitely love to come out to Brazil. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, I've got some friends out there that teach as well, other great teachers, uh, and it would be a lot of fun to come to Brazil. If you want to pay for my ticket, I will come out there tomorrow. So just let me know. Japan is not that far from Brazil. I hear great things about it, and it's a country I'd really love to visit uh, and help a lot of learners at as well.
Ah, so what I've got planned for 2014, uh, at the moment, what I'm really doing is focusing on making Master English Conversation the best program I can make. So I am working a lot with students and improving the program each month. We just began our third year of the program, so we've got lots of members from all over the world that are helping each month. I'm now starting to connect other learners and kind of personally help students do that. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. And also, in addition to that, I want to get more into software so I can start helping even younger students that can uh, kind of, not, not necessarily only younger students, but, uh, you know, especially younger students, but people that are just beginning to learn the language because usually what I teach, and again, if you're watching this, you already understand a lot of English anyway, um, but I want to really get down to uh, kind of the beginners and start helping them so they can get more students up. Uh, to the level at which I usually do my lessons in teaching. Ah, so traditional language teaching. Uh, I want to be very clear about this. I think, uh, again, what I mentioned earlier in this interview, uh, the kind of traditional methods that most people use, it's good for learning part of the fluency puzzle, as I call it. So it's not that, you know, like a textbook is necessarily bad or a grammar drill is bad, something like that. You know, everybody needs to practice. The difference is that, it again, it, it puts you in a bubble. And if you don't also have this other training over here that can help you get out of the bubble and come over to native fluent English, then that's really where the problem is. So, you know, there are kind of many different problems with traditional education, but I think the biggest one is that the, uh, the student is here and the native language is here, and then the, again, the bubble you have uh, stops them from reaching that. So I think, you know, a textbook is not necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is how the information is taught. So the students are given a rule and then kind of, okay, uh, Maybe intellectually they can understand the rule, but the problem is that they can't use it confidently. Or I give you, here's a list of 500 vocabulary words. Please remember these. And then what students do is they write them on flashcards and, you know, they're kind of learning them individually the way a computer might go over some information. So it's not necessarily the the information that students are getting, it's how they're getting that information. So that kind of thing, that, that part of the traditional language learning is something that I don't agree with uh, and I think it's really bad for most learners. And that's why so many people struggle to actually get fluent. Again, they're in this bubble and it's really hard for them to go to that next level because the way that they're being taught, it's basically impossible to, to go to that level from that level. So about grammar, uh, I really think grammar is the foundation of learning, especially if your English is, you know, you're just starting from the very beginning. The difference is that, again, you shouldn't be learning grammar rules, you should be understanding how grammar works. And so basically what I do when I'm teaching, you know, in my private lessons or for my very, very early beginners, and I have, you know, a video series for uh, beginning learners here on YouTube, basically what's happening is that instead of telling them what a rule is, I try to show how the rule works. And if you present information in a simple enough way, that's what's really going to help students master things uh, and understand it intuitively. That way you don't have to tell them a rule and then you put the, the rule is kind of a step between where they are and then they have the rule and then they can kind of learn to speak after that. So if you can kind of forget the, the explanation of the rule but just teach students directly to where they want to go, I think that's ideal. So that's basically what I like to do. So if you're a beginner, and obviously you wouldn't be understanding this video if you were, but for beginners, I think grammar is the most important thing you can work on because when you start building that grammar, it's much better uh, for students to actually you know, practice speaking and they build up the confidence that way. And it's the exact same way that you would teach young children in your own language. So for a young baby, I don't really care how the baby pronounces anything. The grammar is more important. And the grammar, the reason the grammar is important is because that's actually how we communicate. And the again, the grammar is the thing that kind of connects everybody using the language. Everyone might sound a little bit different. Uh, you know, maybe even in the same country, I'm from Chicago and I have a way of pronouncing words, but, you know, somebody from Texas or Australia or the UK, all of these people have different ways of pronouncing things, and yet we all use grammar in basically the same way. So grammar is the foundation of what you should be learning, but how you learn that grammar is really what's most important. 
again, this idea of how grammar gets affected, it's not like grammar is not the problem. It's how grammar is taught that's the problem. And, you know, we can get students to the point, even higher level students, and this is how I teach grammar in Master English Conversation. I may introduce a rule or how something works, but I do that by showing how the grammar works. And I think that's much more important. So when you stop thinking about how something works and you start using it actually, uh, and using it confidently, that's where you really get the motivation to start learning. So again, grammar is not the problem, it's how grammar works. So if you can focus more on using the grammar and as a teacher using uh, examples that kind of use, uh, maybe we're contrasting two ideas or you know, I'm using the context of one thing to teach another. Uh, all of these simple things and I, I keep the explanations really, really simple so that students can actually manipulate that example themselves. So if I have uh, like a black shirt here and then I hold up uh, like a black glove. Now if I'm just teaching the basic grammar here, the word black is the same for both of them. So if I have a black glove and a black shirt. Now the students, you know, if I'm again teaching it simply enough, then uh, students are really going to understand what I'm talking about without me having to mention uh, or translate anything especially uh, or you know explain some rules in that way. So grammar is not the problem, it's how grammar is taught. I don't really have a problem with correcting mistakes, it's just kind of more how you do it. Uh, and usually what I do is, let's say I'm having a conversation with someone, I will repeat back the same thing. Uh, if they say, uh, yesterday I go to the park, then I would say, oh, yesterday you went to the park? And I would try to be obvious about how I'm doing that. Because people want to be corrected, and it's interesting because most of the students that I speak with, and I speak with thousands of them, uh, they're all asking for help. It just kind of depends on how the help is and who the help is coming from. I think those, uh, those kind of two things are the most important. A lot of students have a problem being corrected by other students that are not native. Uh, so if I'm, let's say, a Korean speaker trying to learn English, uh, it's a little bit embarrassing and not very fun if other Korean speakers are trying to correct my English. Uh, again, that's kind of a separate issue, but the point is that people, I think, uh, especially if you want to improve, you want to make mistakes and you want to have those mistakes corrected. So I think there's a trend uh, in kind of trying to help people feel better in the short term instead of really thinking about their education in the long term. And so what that means is that in the short term, I might, you know, maybe I don't correct your mistake and you feel better now, but you'll feel worse later because you didn't, you know, have that training that it actually gave you the confidence to speak. So you have to go through mistakes and you have to have those mistakes corrected. It's just how those are corrected that makes the bigger difference between whether you're encouraging someone or you're kind of pushing them down. I don't really have a you know a particular idea about learning times and the, the problem with learning time is it depends on how you're actually learning. With what I teach, you know, if students are kind of at a particular level, usually the, the, the kind of students that I focus on now, they're already good at reading and writing. They just have lots of problems speaking. And again, I, I explain kind of the reasons for that. It's basically how students learn. And because they're in this bubble, it's pretty easy to lead them out of that if you do that in the right way. So I don't really believe there's a certain number of years that it takes. I mean, you can look at a native speaker in... Um, you know, your own language or even like students that I have. So I have videos on my other channel. This is Shaberi Sensei uh, and you can look that up if you like. But basically in those videos, I actually have younger students and I'm, I'm taking them to the zoo one day. Um, and a few of them, these are students that I've had since they were babies. And I only see them maybe like, you know, for an hour a week. And then as they got a little bit older, I saw them a few times a week. But basically their, their native language is Japanese and not English. But because, again, it, it wasn't necessarily the amount of time it took, it was more how I was able to teach them. But now, you know, two years later, again, and this is only two years and these are just young kids, uh, you know, they're able to understand what I'm saying and actually speak quite confidently. 
So again, I wouldn't really worry about how long something takes. Uh, and I think as a, as a teacher, I really want to help students, you know, improve their English as fast as possible. The only kind of difficult thing, and this is why Master English Conversation is uh, a monthly program, is because there's always new English to learn. And so if, uh, if you are the kind of person that likes lifelong learning and you're always wanting to know new things and what are the new expressions that are people, uh, that people are using, uh, then you know that's something that you'll basically need to continue doing. But as far as the basics go, I think it's really easy uh, to master you know the kind of basic things that you need and the grammar. It just depends on how you teach that. So that's actually one of the things I'll be focusing on probably this year, maybe leading into 2015 with kind of software and other things where I really uh, start growing English Anyone into a much bigger project uh, and I'll be doing that with software. Now this is one of those, I call this a false argument, basically to say, well, should you focus on listening or should you focus on writing or should you focus on reading, that kind of thing. Uh, I think all of these are necessary. And when you're learning, the more input you get in different ways, the faster that information goes into your brain. So when I'm teaching students, I have them write down things, I have them read them, and I have them speak. Uh, but I don't, I don't wait until, you know, maybe three months later for them to start speaking. What you really should be doing is make things that are so simple that students want to begin expressing themselves. And it's really easy to do that. It just depends on how you teach, again. I think podcasts are a really good way to learn English. The problem, uh, and this is the same thing you could say about TV shows and movies uh, or like native English, like even just watching the news. Uh, again, if you are that student that is in this bubble, and this is again the kind of teacher or the kind of student that I teach, if you are in this bubble, and again being in this bubble means that you're good at reading and writing but you can't speak well, the reason for this is that you haven't been exposed to native English. Now, if you're in this bubble and you try to go directly to podcasts like native English podcasts, not kind of like the stuff I do where I'm speaking more slowly, uh, so a learning English podcast is still more kind of in this bubble, uh, in this thing that's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, but again, you've got the fluency gap here in the middle. So you've got the student in the bubble, and then you've got this uh, native English over here. What a lot of students do is they try to, you know, they have the right idea. Okay, I want to understand native English. They know that's what they should be studying. The problem is that they're studying it in the wrong way. So if you go directly from here over to here, that's where the problem happens because it's too fast. You're getting too many idioms and phrases and cultural things that it's just, it's overwhelming for students. And when you, um, when you try to do that, again, to go directly here, uh, it's, it's just really a recipe for disaster. It can be really frustrating for students uh, because they know they're studying the right thing, but they're studying it in the wrong way. And so podcasts are great if you already understand this and you, and you have like a good understanding of idioms and phrases and other things like that, then podcasts are great, movies, TV shows. But if you're not understanding those things, if you don't understand already at least like 80 to 90% of what you're listening to, so that way the new things that come into your brain are easy to understand from the context. If you don't have that, then I do not recommend students do that. Now what I do with Master English Conversation is I kind of take students from here over to here and it's through what I call the fluency bridge. So instead of going directly here where you teach um, kind of have exposure immediately to fast English and idioms and phrases and all of these things at the same time, I take all of those and I teach them in a sequence. And this is really the best way to learn. So when you're learning something new or you're trying to move to a new level, you don't want to get everything at one time. It's kind of learning, like learning to cook. There's actually a lot of uh, you know, complicated things that maybe people don't realize when they're teaching something like that. So you have to take this native English and break it into pieces and then start teaching it that way. And this allows students to have a comfortable, easy way to get to native English. And then once they start understanding these things, then it's okay to start using podcasts and movies and TV shows like that. Now that's actually an interesting question. I know some friends of mine in college, they were trying to use like sleep hypnosis to learn things or to lose weight or to quit smoking, things like that. 
I'm not an expert on this, so I can't really speak about it. But I think uh, if the goal is to actually speak confidently, you should be practicing speaking. Or if the goal is to be a, a better writer, then you should practice writing. Uh, you know, maybe you can sleep or kind of unconsciously or subconsciously learn things. And I, again, I just don't have the information about that. It would be interesting, though, if I could just sit back and do nothing and learn. I think that would be fantastic. But I'm not aware of anybody that really became a great speaker that learned in that way. Okay, so I basically talk about this style of learning in pretty much anything. And the reason I do that is because traditional learning, again, I keep saying this over and over again, but traditional learning, it's basically giving you too much at the same time. So even if you think something is simple, like a teacher, like my name is, I mean, really there's a lot more to that sentence uh, than just, you know, three words or whatever. So basically, instead of trying to get to this other thing directly where you know it would be like kind of a, a complicated thing it's kind of like learning how to drive a car uh, and you know right when you know adults are driving a car now they do it you know without thinking about it but really there are a lot of small pieces that are involved in that you have to be able to watch in the mirror to see what's happening uh, you know you have to know what all of the instruments and you know the time and how fast you're going you know how the brake works and if you have like a transmission and other things like that so there's actually a lot of different pieces that most people don't think about so the teacher uh, has kind of become used to those things and in just like the driving example they think that teaching basic English uh, the actual thing that they think is basic is really not so what you need to do is take things and put them into smaller steps and then when you can focus on uh, achieving each of these in turn then that's going to pull you to the thing that you want faster so I call this also a really great way to get small victories or small wins. And that's when I teach my kind of basic students. I don't teach them rules or anything, and I don't teach them even how to introduce themselves before I've given them some really basic ways to understand some grammar. And once they do that, they're, they're really kind of changing the way that they think about language learning, and it becomes fun and easy and exciting for them. So that's when you can start you know, teaching them more difficult things. But breaking something down and then focusing on the most important pieces of that in the right order that's really what you need to do in order to start you know not only teaching but anytime you want to learn something so whether it's cooking or like martial arts I want to learn like you know Taekwondo or something like that you know I wouldn't just jump into a fight with a whole bunch of guys I would learn a few steps and try a move and practice it a lot that kind of thing and then you start putting those together so how did I get fluent in Japanese and what advice would I give to other learners? Basically, I started using the traditional method and none of it worked. And that's why, again, like I, I feel so passionate about teaching now uh, because being able to speak, you know, even going in like, like this haircut. You know, I walk into a, a, like a Japanese barber and I'm able to tell them exactly what I want to. I remember the first time many years ago when I first came to Japan, I tried to go into a barber and I had to like hold up a picture of something and I still couldn't even explain what it was, you know. And, you know, they didn't like shave all my hair off, but it took a lot of like, you know, just like cut it a little and you know talking like that so you know the benefits of fluency uh, are fantastic but the way that I learned again it was more in this same kind of way where I took instead of using what I was getting in a book I took the actual native English or I guess in the Japanese example the native Japanese that I was learning uh, and I broke it down into pieces and this is exactly the same way that I teach English now the only problem is that when you're the teacher for yourself because I couldn't find any system that was actually teaching Japanese like that uh, it's just really it takes a really really long time so now I'm, I'm really happy to be able to provide that for students they don't have to think about what English to learn or how to break it down themselves so I break it down for students and teach them in simple easy steps already which is uh, is a it's a great service that I'm happy to provide for learners now the thing about learning Japanese is that number one I had to break it down but number two I actually actually kind of had to practice these things uh, and so what I did, like I give this example a lot when I speak to people, uh, but I talk about just one example here is me going to a grocery store and practicing my speaking uh, with a kind of fluency mission. And I wouldn't be trying to have a whole conversation with people. I would just have one phrase like, where is the milk? 
and I can practice that same thing and you have a pattern there of where it is. So I, I walk into a store uh, and I say like where is the milk uh, or like where is the sugar and I can use that same phrase over and over again and if I were to use it now like Giyu ni wa doko desu ka? or uh, like sato wa doko desu ka? like if I use it over and over again you would understand the pattern even if I don't you know kind of teach you what each of the things are but like doko desu ka is where is it uh, and then I'm just using basically the vocabulary and then I'm walking around the store and it becomes, it kind of gets embedded in my mind that way. And that's why as part of Master English Conversation now, when I teach, each month students get a mission like that where they have to read or write or practice or go out and speak, that kind of thing. Because that's what really gets students uh, more motivated and helps the language go deeper into their brain. So basically those two things are what helped me, um, you know, kind of get out of this bubble that people are stuck in that, that stops them from improving. The problem was that I just kind of had to do it myself. So I don't recommend doing that. It's nice if you have a teacher that can help you. Uh, but in this case, it's basically those two things. So how you learn and then how you practice. I think one of the biggest difficulties I had when I was learning Japanese is kind of living in a more rural area of Japan and so it's extra difficult to understand a lot of the people uh, you know like my my friend's grandmother or grandfather and I'm trying to talk with them uh, or even in the case of my gardening teacher so that's why I came to Japan and when I began learning gardening out here in Japan uh, I couldn't speak really any Japanese at all and my Japanese gardening teacher didn't know any English and so he tried to be a bit more clear but you know working with other people on the gardening crew you know they would be speaking fast Japanese and it would be a difficult to understand dialect uh, so I really had to focus on that it was more kind of like the listening there and again the that's the that's the really big shift where you try to try to get out of this bubble and try to get into the native language that you're learning and you really need to do that in steps that's really the best way to do that and unfortunately I didn't have any program like that when I was just learning uh, but now English learners do and that's why you know I created master English conversation uh, but so that kind of thing there like the the, the moving from from here to here that's really the most difficult problem that I had and that's what a lot of other learners experience now do I think traveling to another country is necessary absolutely not I know students that you know they're Japanese students they come to America and they all just sit and talk to each other and none of them can speak very well but I know other Japanese people that are in Japan and I meet them and they've never been to America they've never even been out of Japan and they're able to speak just fine what's the difference now the main thing here is again it's how they learn and what they study so you, again you've got these kind of two things you know they're learning that conversational English but they're learning it in the kind of right way where they're able to uh, transition from that school learning to the real school of you know kind of native English or native Japanese in that way so you don't have to move to a different country and especially with the internet now it's easy to connect with other people and I can sit you know just like I'm talking uh, to you right now you know I could have a Skype conversation with someone or I could meet you know other people that are in my area now the really cool thing about English is that right now there are more non-native speakers of English on the planet than there are native speakers so wherever you are in the world the chances are better of you meeting some non-native speaker so the again that's why you know kind of the pronunciation is not so important but the grammar is because you'll be connecting with all these different people uh, but you can find lots of people to practice with and the way of learning again we've got kind of video learning just the way I teach or you know there's plenty of videos on YouTube that you can watch as well so there are lots of different ways to practice and you certainly don't need to move to a different country I remember uh, a lot of the improvement that I saw in my Japanese it was when I went back to America for a little while and I was kind of like trying things and you know I found other Japanese speakers uh, to practice with but also some people that were foreigners that I knew that had been to Japan and they were at a level higher than me and they could help me and teach me a little bit as well okay I want to be really clear about this accent issue number one your grammar is more important than your pronunciation but okay now that we understand that I've said it over and over again uh, 
try not to think about accent reduction or getting rid of your accent. What you want to do is adopt a new one. So it's really difficult to tell your brain to stop doing something because your brain doesn't understand the difference between stop doing something and do something because the focus is still on that thing. So instead of worrying about how your pronunciation is bad or what you don't like, what you should be focusing on what you do like. And so the best way to do that is to listen to lots of different people and then to find a voice that works best for you. So this is what I call your English voice. Now each person, you know, just like myself, I have my own Japanese voice as well. I like to mimic lots of different sounds, but my regular speaking voice you know, it's just, you know, it sounds a little bit American and sometimes I turn on that extra Japanese-ness if I want to sound more like that in Japanese. But basically, uh, I have my, my own kind of way of speaking and I'm happy with that. So I'm not really trying to stop sounding foreign. I'm more, who's a good person that I can copy? And then what I do from there is instead of just listening and repeating, I really focus on mastering that person's accent or the way they speak or the way they move in my mind first. So I listen and then I focus on how that sounds and this is something actually I'm teaching in the uh, upcoming lesson for Master English Conversation for February. Uh, but I teach um, you know this kind of method of instead of just listen and repeat you listen and then you stop and you try to you know master that pronunciation in your head and then uh, you know, master it, you know, not only the other person saying that thing, but then you saying it in your head as well, and then you go out and practice that thing. So that's something I go into detail more about in Master English Conversation, uh, but basically that's the best thing I would recommend for students. So figure out uh, a kind of voice that you like, listen to lots of different people and find someone that would be a good voice for you, and then practice that with visualization. So I don't really think Japanese people are, it's any more difficult for them learning English than for, you know, anybody else in another country learning. Uh, maybe some languages are a little bit closer to English, so certainly Spanish, you know, you've already got the alphabet there, uh, you know, and other sounds and words that are quite similar or even the same. And then Japanese, you've got different writing. There's actually three different uh, writing systems or three different written languages in Japanese, all kind of character sets that work together, uh, which is a real pain in the ass. You got like many thousands of characters actually that you have to learn if you want to write, and I'm not even a very good writer. Uh, I just don't care about that actually at the moment. But the interesting thing about learning uh, for Japan is that there's uh, a kind of typical way of learning, and that's the kind of textbook learning, this thing that are basically uh, preparing students for tests. And again, if you're in that, if you're a parent watching this or a teacher, you just have to understand, well, if this is the goal, you know, you have to uh, practice for the test so you can get into school or the business or, you know, whatever job you want. Uh, you have to have this other education over here, which is actually teaching you how to speak. So I think uh, this kind of traditional way of learning is pretty much everywhere throughout the world and that's why I'm really trying to work to create a much better system to help people start learning from the very beginning so that that way you don't have to learn uh, English through your language, which is really the biggest problem that stops people from being able to express themselves confidently uh, and then, you, you know, again, being able to remember things or to use grammar without thinking about it. So again, I don't really think there's anything particularly different about Japan rather than other countries. You know, each country has its own, um, you know, kind of problems or unique things like, you know, in, in Japanese, they'll kind of use the uh, Japanese sounds instead of learning English because every word in a Japanese textbook for, for English learners, uh, it has the English and then it has the Japanese uh, kind of romanization of what that is. So they will take a word. Um, I'm trying to think of like, uh, like Chicago is like a pretty easy word. So you've got like, you know, like Chicago in, you know, Japanese, you've got all of those sounds. Uh, but like baseball would be like baseball, you know, something like that. And my pronunciation of katakana, this is the way of taking English sounds and changing them into Japanese, my katakana pronunciation is probably the worst of all because I don't understand what word they're trying to change into something else. So a word like a karaoke, you know, that's like 
oke okay is like from orchestra in English, and then you've got kara, which is open, and you, it, it's, it's just a weird kind of mix of things like that. But again, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong. Each country has their own kind of challenges. But if you learn in the right way, I have students all over the world that I teach, and they're all improving their English. So it doesn't really matter what language they're coming from. Okay, I think I gave the answer to this one already, but basically, if you haven't guessed it already, I'd much rather, if I'm a speaker of a different language, I'd much rather have excellent communication, excellent grammar, with a, a not-so-great pronunciation, you know, if I had to choose between the two. The accent is not so important as long as people can understand what you're saying. So if people, if your accent is really, really bad, you know, you could have excellent grammar, but blah, 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 blah. but if people don't understand what you're saying, that's going to be a really big problem. So other than that, I don't think, you know, it would be uh, that big of a deal to have a, an accent. You know, I have a bit of an accent or, you know, other people do, but that's okay. You know, you've got lots of different Japanese speakers. Uh, even native speakers that sound, you know, one way in one area, they use different languages or kind of different words or intonation in another. So it's just not that big of a deal. Focus on mastering the basics so that you can communicate confidently. And then once you have that confidence, that will take you to the next level where you can really start improving your pronunciation. So don't worry about the pronunciation first. The only thing you should be really worrying about as far as pronunciation goes is learning how to kind of master a few of the individual native English sounds and learning to blend them together. So other than that, basically focus on communication before you worry about your accent. Ah, words of wisdom. Well, this is kind of tricky. The best thing I can say to students is take action. You have to go out, uh, but you also have to take action the right way. So if you are stuck here and you know you are trying to, to to get to this level over here and it's just too difficult then stop you're you're trying to do something that's just not possible for your level you need to take things in steps you need to learn things in steps too so if you have a particular tv show that you really like take that one tv show and really focus on it it will be difficult for you but if that's what you'd like to do that's what you want to learn and master uh, then focus on that thing so what I do again with Master English Conversation is I help students move from here over to here in simple, easy steps. So you learn the real conversational English, you start developing an ear for how native speakers really sound, learning how to think and use grammar automatically, uh, and actually remember what you speak. So you stop translating and you can really just enjoy your conversations more. So you don't have to join the program if you don't want to. It's certainly you know, an option for anybody, but it's that method of learning where you take what you want to get to, this level over here, but you have to break it down into pieces and learn those first so that it's nice and easy and automatic for your brain to understand. So other than that, take action, go out, practice your speaking, you know, practice reading, writing, listening, and speaking. All of these things together will help you improve. Don't, you know, like, I, I would even just, you know, for yourself, use uh, yourself as a kind of language learning laboratory. You can, you know, read blogs and listen to teachers like me tell you what to do, but, you know, just do your own thing. Find out what works for you and, and do that. Maybe writing is really the best thing for you. Maybe it's speaking or listening. You know, don't listen to me sometimes. It's not a big deal. Find your own path and find your own voice as well. Well, I hope uh, I've been uh, able to help with this interview. If you have any questions, uh, and want to add anything else, please post them in the comments down below this video. Uh, and be sure to give this a big like. Thanks again to uh, Diego from uh, Park Idiomas. I really like to say that. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it. I don't know Portuguese very well, but I'm guessing that's probably, you know, maybe how they would pronounce it. Uh, maybe they can teach me when I come to Brazil. Anyway, have a fantastic day. Get out and practice. And if you have a question or comment, post it below. Be sure to like this video. Yeah, look at that little button down there. All right, bye-bye.